Well, good, good evening to you. And uh, I would like just to speak to you today on the fingerprint of intelligence, thermodynamics and information. My name is Professor Andy McIntosh and I am an emeritus professor at the University of Leeds and my work now is such that if I do anything for the university they don't pay me anymore so I'm now uh, uh, free as it were to speak on the things that I would like to speak on as well and uh, not just working for the university but I still do some work a little bit for the university still attached to them and I live in the north of England in Manchester. I want to speak to you about the laws of thermodynamics, the, uh, the various issues to do with entropy, devices and machines, and even right down to the biochemistry of DNA and ATP. Then I'm going to make an important connection with information and draw some conclusions from it. We need to understand that there are three laws of thermodynamics. The laws, there is actually a a zeroth law but I, I won't be referring to that at this point so strictly there's four but the main three laws are the conservation of energy that the total amount of energy in a given system is conserved and energy is therefore neither created nor destroyed now we can represent this in a number of ways but the probably the best way is the way that I'm doing it in terms of the mathematics here that there is always a change in the internal energy of a system when energy is being used and if that change in energy is associated with heat flow as generally that will be happening not necessarily always but usually that's what happens in real systems the convention is that we talk about dq being the heat supplied to the system so if the system itself is doing work then it's going to be minus dq so the change in internal energy is the is the heat supplied to the system which may or not may or may not be taking place minus the work done by the system so if there's no heat being exchanged then the change in the internal energy is simply um, uh, the work done by uh, you simply add in the work done by the system and that then must be zero but usually there is heat being used up or else heat is being generated i've got a diagram here for heat being generated and that is often the case so if you've got something like an aircraft engine it's giving off energy and the point about entropy, which leads us now into the second law, is that the second law is saying that if heat is being given out, it will always be such that there will be some you could never retrieve. You'll never be able to get that energy back. So we call this essentially the entropy. It's divided by temperature but it's energy divided by temperature, wasted energy, if you like. Heat, which no longer can be used in some way. So the first law is saying that there is a balance of work done and the energy is being conserved. It's either going off as heat in the example that I'm showing you, or else there can be cases where actually heat is coming in, or else it's being used to do work. If that's happening, you know, there's always some entropy being given off, which is effectively wasted energy per degree or disorganized energy. So that's the second law. And we're thinking here about an isolated system. It's not um, something which perhaps most people are aware of, but actually the second law strictly only applies, applies if you've got a boundary where nothing else is crossing it, including energy and material. However, I'm going to talk about things where there is a boundary, where people um, think that that second law doesn't have any bearing. Actually, it does, as we shall see. But the second law is essentially saying that there is an arrow of time in any system, that there is a winding down. And 
there is also a third law here, and that is that the entropy of the system approaches a constant value as its temperature approaches absolute zero. No system actually can reach this temperature where the constant entropy for most real systems is actually zero itself. But what this is saying is that there is a heat death which everything is heading to. And that is what we call the third law of thermodynamics. So there is a lowest possible temperature and that was a very important finding and it's the absolute zero of the Kelvin scale. So if we summarize these three laws, energy is neither created nor destroyed. Energy is gradually getting used up and the net useful energy in the overall system is winding down. And all systems will eventually approach zero degrees Kelvin, but they never actually quite achieve this. So you might deal with this colloquially in a, you know, in a way that perhaps people can just see the point that really is going on here. I'm using very loose terms, of course. The first law is basically to say you can't win. You can't, you can only really break even. But even then, in reality, you cannot even get to breaking even because um, the, in order to break even, you'd have to go to zero degrees Kelvin and nobody can ever get there. So you're really always losing out. You cannot beat the clock in that sense because of this direction that everything in the second law is saying that things are winding down. In the past, of course, the universe, uh, uh, you might say, must always have been there. And certainly the secularists will be saying that. And the first law strongly suggests that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So there is no creation of energy. And yet the second law is saying that there is an arrow of time. So if you start winding back on the second law, you end up saying that there has been a beginning because otherwise you'd have infinite energy in the past if you went back for an infinite time and that is not acceptable there must be even though it's huge the universe is nevertheless there must be a finite limit to the energy that there is there and everything is going towards a heat death uh, in the future so you can see that these two laws the first two laws are actually not consistent with each other until you say that there must have been a sort of singularity in the beginning where the energy came and then it came and nothing else happened uh, from outside. Well, that of course is consistent with the fact that there is a beginning and that God made the energy to begin with. Now let's come to open systems. I had a discussion with Richard Dawkins once and this is often been said that in order to deal with the machinery that you need for life and the energetic systems right down to the biochemical level, he was saying, well, there's lots of energy out there that could make these systems. But he was essentially proposing something that energy on its own can produce the machinery of life that is needed. And Frankly, I want to challenge that and say that even in an open system, it is not sufficient to say that energy is flowing in, therefore we can have the machinery and the, uh, all, all the intricate systems that are needed to make living systems or to make any working system, living or not. We're going to see that this really doesn't work this is not a scientific system because energy on its own does not produce the raised free energy which is needed in order for a system to work. I'll define free energy shortly. Let's look at the thermodynamics of leaves. Leaves we take for granted, there are literally billions of them, but what is happening thermodynamically is very important to understand. For dead leaves, 
energy just falling on dead leaves does nothing it just simply heats up the leaves or the branches dead they're not doing anything because in a living leaf there is photosynthesis going on which isn't going in with a dead leaf so let's look at the photosynthesis of living systems or living plants and trees the energy from the sun is absorbed along with the carbon dioxide and water through photosynthesis and an important point here is that there is chlorophyll in the leaf which acts as a catalyst to the following biochemical reaction carbon dioxide water which is spread out beautifully on veins on the surface of the leaf because the plant is carrying water then the radiant energy coming in from the sun um, turns that water and carbon dioxide into sugar c6h12o6 plus some of the oxygen is left and the water which of course that is very important for the sugar for the plant but oxygen of course for the mammals and ourselves to breathe so you actually need machinery there I don't mean nuts and bolts, I'm talking here about a biochemical system, but you need a, a system which is able to absorb the radiant energy and to put that energy down specific pathways in order to produce the sugars needed for the plant. Energy on its own does not do that. It doesn't raise the free energy of the system. And it's the free energy which is absolutely vital for doing the machinery or doing the biochemistry of this living system. The chlorophyll is, uh, is there purposely to encourage this surface chemistry reaction with the energy coming in from the sun. The free energy then is absolutely essential we need a device for raising the useful energy in the system that's what free energy is so there is a fourth principle which applies to non-isolated systems that is open systems and this principle i would tentatively call a fourth law of thermodynamics in an unisolated system the free energy potential will never be greater than the total of that which was there already initially in the isolated system and that coming in through the boundary so it is important to understand that free energy has a specific definition meaning the energy which is available to do work it is the it is the conversion of the random energy coming in from the sun into useful energy which can be used that's what we mean by free energy technically it's the overall enthalpy minus the enthalpy means the overall energy available that overall enthalpy minus the entropy times the temperature so having defined free energy we now just consider again this proposal by Dawkins and others frankly is that possible the answer is no real systems don't work like that random energy doesn't build machines because of this fourth principle the free energy potential which is vital for energy being used by that particular machinery it's never greater than the total of that which was there already and that which may be coming in through the boundary in other words you've got to have something like a solar cell which is an artificial equivalent of uh, the leaf that i was talking about that's got to be there already ready to receive the energy from the sun so i hope this isn't you but thermodynamics can be confusing but i hope that this will actually just free your mind a little bit as I use some illustrations. Some children play with these toys, which are slinky, well, wired springs. And 
effectively they only work because there is some input of ordered energy to begin with such that all the change in the free energy is then downhill so that the energy is being used up so just looking at this slinky you see that it actually will move and even go downstairs because you're setting up with some energy to begin with which then bounces this spring down the stairs and that's because everything thermodynamically tends to go literally in this case but generally speaking downhill there needs to be an energy raised and then that energy gets used up things don't go the other way spontaneously so you've got to set the free energy raised to begin with then that's released in order to enable it to do work and we need to define then a machine and i'm going to do this by saying it's a device which harnesses or captures or holds the energy in some way converting it with to work with measurable regularity we call that a free energy free energy device and in my illustration here, a chair, though it's a very useful device, it's not a machine because it's not using energy. But an injector seat is a machine as it is a device which converts energy to do work. So that's one comparison which might just help us to see what I mean by a machine. It's a device which harnesses energy enabling it to do work with measurable regularity um, let's take another case a tornado certainly uses energy but it's not a machine since it is a mechanism yes for dissipating energy but it's not doing it with a regular predictable outcome you wouldn't use a tornado to stir your tea in the morning uh, you need something very precise and measurable. A wind turbine is a machine as it converts energy with regularity. So this is what we mean by a machine being a device which locally raises the free energy. So energy on its own does not produce a machine in answer to Richard Dawkins and others who would try to insist it does. Now, if I use this model as an illustration, you'll see here that I've got something on top of this turbine. It's not a wind turbine, it looks like it, but actually it is a solar cell, which is on the top of this turbine. If you look at the picture of me in the top hand right hand corner, you'll see that I'm showing you this. So if we put the light which is representing here the sun and it shines on the solar cell then it produces power or a powered system with the turbine going round. if i put my fingers over the solar cell then of course nothing happens you see just putting heat into the system does nothing it's acting like a dead stick that i said earlier but as soon as you actually enable the system to take random energy and send it down specific pathways which in this case is electricity to drive that turbine then everything works so the idea that random energy could produce machines is frankly nonsense you've got to have the solar cell in what i just showed you in order to make things work just as you need the photosynthesis the chlorophyll and the spreading of veins with the water just under the surface of the leaf in order to make the random energy from the sun produce the sugars in the plant now cells are full of this type of machinery please don't think i'm thinking of nuts and bolts i am thinking in a very specific way 
as I earlier defined, of machines. And right at the heart of the cell is the production of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, by the ATP synthase motor. This is an electrostatic motor, which frankly, Faraday, who discovered the, the issue of electric motors, this is not quite an electric motor, it's an electrostatic motor, but nevertheless, I think he would be hugely impressed with this discovery. You've got hydrogen ions going across a membrane, and these are driving a motor which takes in the ingredients adenosine diphosphate and the inorganic phosphate and it bolts the inorganic phosphate onto the ADP to make it not a diphosphate but a triphosphate which is an unstable molecule but it's ready to do work in a number of ways. One of them is to drive this kinesin walking molecule. Let me play this to you where it mentions the use of ATP. Meet the kinesin. Masterpieces of microengineering, kinesins are miniature motorized machines that carry cargo from one part of the cell to another, walking along self assembling highways called microtubules. Known as the workhorses of the cell, kinesins have two feet, or globular heads, that literally walk one foot over another along the microtubule, pulling their cargo to its destination. Each foot possesses two special locations, called binding sites, that interact with other molecules. One site attaches to the microtubule, and the other binds with ATP, the energy molecule of the cell. When one foot binds with ATP and uses its energy, the foot flips over, resulting in the walking motion. So ATP is absolutely essential for this incredible walking molecule, which actually has proteins building its own microtubule road as it goes along. Um, that itself is a wonder, but the ATP is essential for the walking motion, which is not random. The ATP is there deliberately interacting with those legs shown in this uh, system this biochemical uh, walking molecule, and it causes them to flip over, causing the walking motion. This is staggering, and when you see these types of miniature machines right down at the molecular level, this shouts to us that there must be design, but also the thermodynamics is telling you that there are very precise pathways that the energy must flow down in biochemical terms and the ATP production is itself amazing from the ATP synthase motor. Now that very unstable ATP is being used for other systems like kinesin. And of course, this is all very relevant to the very fabric on which the information system is written in our DNA. There are four letters represented by the um, by the nucleotides which are the rungs across the ladder of DNA. These four nucleotides are there in triplets cytosine, thymine, thymine. If you look at the bottom right here and you've got cytosine, adenine, thymine and then you've got another triplet guanine, guanine, adenine and these will code precisely for different amino acids which then build up specific proteins. The 20,000 plus genes in human beings code for proteins made from these very amino acids which themselves are coded for, not made by, please note, by the nucleotides, but coded for by those triplets of amino acids. Uh, triplets, sorry, of nucleotides, which make a specific amino acids. So this is hugely indicating as a massive signpost that there is design in living systems. 
thinking still of the thermodynamics, DNA and its buildup of the phosphate bonds on the vertical rungs of the ladder is not going to be possible without cellular res respiration. In other words, you've got to provide energy into this system in order to polymerize the vertical rungs of DNA. You need free energy. It's back to the thermodynamics again. Let me just diagrammatically show you these phosphates attached to a part of the nucleotide, which you can just see here on the right. So you've got sugar phosphate bonds, then you've got the base and the adenine, the base and cytosine and so on. And then you've got the mirror image on the other side as A, as T goes to A, G goes to C, C goes to G, and A goes to T. And what I'm talking about is the, and I'm going to do this again so you can see it, is the polymerizing that is adding, look on the right hand side now, as we add sugar phosphate bonds. That is not done randomly. You actually need a triphosphate in order to make those bonds work on the vertical strands of the DNA. And this, frankly, is staggering in terms of the chemistry of what is taking place. I've already mentioned that spontaneously the free energy is always being used up. Essentially, you've got exothermic and we sometimes call these end uh, uh, sorry exogenic reactions that is that those reactions which are spontaneous are giving off energy which is the diagram on the right the delta g is actually going down it's becoming neg it's becoming less than what it was before to make the delta g go positive you actually have to put energy in, in a very specific pathway. And these do not happen spontaneously. We call those endogenic reactions. They use up energy in a very special way. So this point is now hugely relevant in the polymerizing of DNA. I said that a machine is a device which harnesses the energy for converting it to do work. A good illustration of this is a hydroelectric dam. Raw energy is harnessed as the dam holds the water. There is a large increase in the free energy as the water piles up behind the dam. And then when it flows, it does work in driving turbines usually to convert the water flow to electrical energy. Well, in living systems, it's the same matter. You've got to have an endogenic system initially to actually store the energy, and then you need to let the energy go to do the polymerizing of the DNA. And the ATP synthase motor is raising the free energy by making the triphosphate, which is then used, and it's going downhill now, in the polymerization of DNA. So if you're adding energy in, it's endothermic. And if you're using the energy, then it's exothermic. So exogenic and endogenic was the term I use, which is, is the same point. So if we want to actually get to energizing and uh, the, 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 the sugar phosphate bonds such that they will bind together on the vertical part of DNA. What we have to do is to make an intermediate such that then that is above the energy that you need and the energy is then used to get to the finishing line of actually making the DNA. And involved in here is an activation energy and chemistry particularly uh, carbon at ke hydrocarbon chemistry is full of activation energy. In fact, all chemistry involves uh, chemical reactions which are using activation energies. The raw building blocks to make DNA 
cannot just be left to do it on their own because the free energy change is positive. But if you go from the raw building blocks to energized building blocks, and that is where ATP is being used, it's a high energy compound, then you can relax down from those intermediates to DNA. And that is what's happening in the polymerizing of DNA. But ATP is a very unstable substance, it's never found outside living cells, and yet DNA cannot be formed without this. It needs, ATP needs highly organized chemical pathways itself for it to be made using the ATP synthase motor. And DNA it requires it. And indeed in the DNA is programming instructions for making ATP synthase. So you really got a chicken and egg situation here. Without a, this high activation energy reaction, nothing would happen. But with the triphosphates, which is the intermediates, then we can make the polymerization of DNA work. And then it happens through this intermediate ATP. So really the whole lesson here is that there is uphill thermodynamics. I know you thought that was hard work, but we need to realize that the science is very complicated in forming DNA. And it involves very special pathways thermodynamically. The connection then with information. Information, George Williams has said, doesn't have mass or charge. It doesn't have length in millimeters. And information is not the same as matter or energy. Or energy. In information terms, you talk about bits and bytes. But matter and energy don't have those sorts of units. In fact, the two systems are rather different. And yet both are real. Matter and energy is real, but so is information. And we need to realize this. No progress can be made, he is saying here, without recognizing this. Now, a lot of my uh, thoughts here are expressed in my paper, Information and Entropy, Top-Down or Bottom-Up Development in Living Systems in the International Journal of Design and Nature some years ago. And I've written another paper a bit more recently on information and thermodynamics in living systems, which is produced by World Scientific. And that um, is in a special conference, which was called Biological Information, New Perspectives. Now people say, well, we can get information by mutations, but actually you don't information actually is lost by mutations. If I have random mutations like the first set of letters, it may be the same length as the sentence below, but it's not saying anything because the sentence that I've got below is an English sentence, which is understood with English being the recognized convention for the words. Time and tide wait for no man. Information requires specific sequencing. Indeed, if I had a lava lamp, which happened to have a figure which looked like 22, um, and the oil and the wax was forming this, if it then, you know, just by accident went to 32, you'd say, oh, well, that's a bit odd. And if it then went to 42 and 52, you'd say, somebody's definitely trying to talk to me and communicate. You know that information is there when you cannot see any natural law to explain the formation of those letters or numbers. And actually that's an important point. Information is when you cannot see that there is a reason from physics and chemistry to form a particular pattern in words, the way that they are formed. Pattern and arrangement indicates that you've got language present. Information involves codes and language, but it also involves message. The message uses the code and the language but also the code and the language uses 
some sort of substrate or hardware. I use the illustration here of a computer. The hardware doesn't write its own software, just like the music of this violin concerto by Mendelssohn wasn't written by the paper or by the ink on the score. It wasn't even written by the violins that are being used to play. It came from the mind of Mendelssohn and that, if you like, is the software and then used the hardware to enact the instructions of the software. Somebody has once said there are one zero kinds of people. Those who read binary, binary and those who don't. Which is a very good point, isn't it? That codes actually require you to understand the code coding system, which in this case, of course, is binary. The one and zero doesn't represent 10. It represents two to the one and two to the zero. And you can write all these numbers in binary using zeros and ones. Information requires specific sequencing and an agreed code between sender and receiver. Language and code is vital for the message, but language and code is not defined by the material. You can see here a set of dashes and dots. It's Morse code, and the Morse code is equivalent to this English sentence. I'm trying to tell you something. But unless you understood the Morse code, you wouldn't get the message. So language and code has to be agreed beforehand. Then, secondly, the message uses the language and the code. Pierre Bouchard discovered the Ros Rosetta Stone in 1799 during the Napoleonic Wars. And the message was written in three languages. Hieroglyphics, Demotic, and Greek. And because we understood Greek, we could then work out what the hieroglyphics at the top meant. And this was a very important illustration that the same message can use different codes. You might wonder what these dots and dashes are. Well, with the Morse code, you would work out that actually this says that John loves Mary. But I think Mary would prefer it to be written in English, maybe on the sand as they're walking down the beach, rather than having it in Morse code, but it illustrates the point. Message transcends code, and the language and the code transcends the material on which it is written. Professor Git has really brought this out in his excellent book, Information, the Third Fundamental Quantity, Matter, Energy, Information. Information is not the same, as we said earlier. Stephen Jay Gould suggested that keep the coding, non-material ideas separate to the matter and the energy. Well, in a sense, he's right, because they are defined in different terms but we need to recognize that that's not going to work when you look at real systems because of this very point that the information is is using a substrate of biochemistry which is the biochemical molecules of dna and rna so information does impinge on matter and energy and in the overlap, you have software use, used by intelligence, mind and consciousness, which is controlling the hardware. And just like what happens in a computer. So as I close, the evolutionary view, which is the bottom up view of the left, says that matter and energy produced the nucleotides, which produced information, which then showed mind and intelligence at work but actually it's the opposite the real science shows that information which is non-material comes from a mind and intelligence controls through information systems 
the hardware of nucleotides and the thermodynamics and the biochemistry of matter and energy. It is the top down view, which is the correct view of thermodynamics and information systems. So actually with information, there are principles concerning information, language and communication. The first one is that information cannot be derived from nothing. There has to be a precursor bank of such information. That, of course, is similar to the first law of thermodynamics. And the second principle concerns communication of information. All information degenerates in terms of its functional utility. That is very similar to the second law of thermodynamics. And the third principle of information is that the information content is never greater than the total of that which was there already and that which was coming in as information through the boundary of the system. And this mirrors, of course, the tentative uh, fourth law that I was expressing of non-isolated systems, the thermodynamics of non-isolated systems. These three laws are the laws of information production and communications. These are always obeyed in computer systems and also in any information system like that which we see in living systems in DNA. So in conclusion, the, the naturalistic origin of molecular machines is essentially against the thermodynamics of open systems. The thermodynamics drives naturally to equilibrium. Open systems cannot of themselves build free energy. And there is a tentative fourth law of thermodynamics for open systems, which I've written there. The free energy potential is never greater than the total of that which was there already and that coming in through the boundary. The other conclusion is that information is non-material. It sits on matter and energy, uses it, but is not defined by it. It transcends it, but uses the substrate of the matter and energy that it's sitting on. It's connected with matter and functions even at the molecular level. And there are principles of information exchange which parallel the laws of thermodynamics. The Bible speaks about God upholding all things by the word of his power. It also speaks about God being the one in him we live and move and have our being. Kepler talked about thinking God's thoughts after him. The verse I quoted earlier in Hebrews, upholding all things by the word of his power, it's in the context, it's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word who has been revealed to us when he came into this world in flesh and blood and even died on a cross that we might be forgiven. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 that Christ being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. He is the creator. And the Bible says that he upholds all things by his power, by his, the word of his power. So it's hardly surprising that we find in John chapter 1 verse 1 that it says that in the beginning was not the molecules. But in the beginning was the Logos. And that is totally consistent with the science. I submit to you that the science of thermodynamics and information is the fingerprint of God at work, making this world and sustaining it. Thank you.